Nick, there's something important I must discuss with you, she started, urging me to maintain composure. Please hear me out fully before you respond. Her words landed on me with a forceful impact, leaving me momentarily stunned. She disclosed that Mike had been her first love, and they were once engaged with plans of marriage. However, their romance dissolved when he fell in love with his late wife. Recently, Mike reached out to her, confessing his enduring love and profound loneliness. Reluctantly, she confessed lingering sentiments for him, yet reassured, my love for you remains steadfast. Although I was silent, it was difficult for me to regulate my breathing and keep my composure. Nancy took this as a sign of newfound determination and smiled encouragingly as she continued, I want to remain your wife, but I also want to be with Mike. After discussing this with him, we decided that it would be fair if I spent one week with you and the next with him. Without saying a word, I got out of bed, hurriedly dressed, and left the house. My destination was my office, where I sought solace behind a closed door. With a heavy heart, I dialed Lopez's number. When he entered the room, he looked at my unkempt face but refrained from asking questions. Seeing that I was constantly staying up late, he understood the reason for my disheveled appearance. I made it clear to him that I didn't want to be disturbed unless it was an extremely important matter. Fortunately, my request was respected, and I was left alone. Reflecting on the situation, I wondered if she was really that forgetful or if I had somehow fallen into an alternate reality. For several hours, I sat in a dimly lit office, repeatedly scrutinizing the offer made by my wife. It seemed to me the epitome of egocentrism. Nancy seemed to want to get both benefits and pleasure without making any compromises. It was clear that everything would not go as planned, she had no choice but to make a decision. I got home around 5 o'clock, but I was furious at the sight of Mike's car parked at the entrance. This brute really had the nerve. It took me a good five minutes to calm down and let my anger dissipate. Reluctantly, I left the gun on the dashboard of the car, knowing full well that bringing it inside could only lead to catastrophic consequences. Despite years of training, nothing could have prepared me for such a situation. When I entered the living room, they were sitting there, visibly nervous. Nancy got up quickly and came over to kiss me, but I instinctively pushed her away. I noticed her pain but remained indifferent. Nancy spoke anxiously, we really need to discuss this. I answered sharply, there is nothing to discuss. You have to choose between him and me. You can't have both of us. Mike, feeling awkward, looked at me and said, I don't think you fully consider this offer. I'm not trying to take your wife away from you. I just want to give her the extra love she needs. Yes, we will share her, but she will never neglect her duties as a wife. The inner rage in me reached its peak. This arrogant man had the audacity to suggest that I agree to Nancy sleeping with him because she supposedly needs more affection. I felt disgusted with both of them. At that moment, I realized that my marriage was beyond repair. I refused to comply with this offer. Nancy said with a disapproving expression, Nick, we're going all the way. The only question is whether you will participate in this or not. Leave our house with him. Nancy's tears flowed uncontrollably as she begged me, please, Nick, let me do this. I've been faithful to you all these years. Mike was my first love, but I don't want to lose you. My love for you is immense, but I still have feelings for Mike. I snorted and turned to face him, looking for an answer. Tell me, Mike, if your late wife had approached you with such an offer, would you have agreed? Mike's face softened as he answered, if it would bring happiness to my wife, I would willingly agree. A smile appeared on his lips. Nancy looked at me again, her eyes full of hope and uncertainty. What about you, dear? If I came home with my ex-partner Nancy paused, considering her answer. If you had shared yourself with her, I admit that at first, it would have upset me as well, as how you feel now. But since I love you and want your happiness above all else, I truly love you and want your happiness above all else, I would eventually come to terms with it. Despite this, I have to express my concern because I still have unresolved emotions about this situation. Taking a deep breath, I continued, given the circumstances, 
I think it would be better for us to contact a lawyer tomorrow to start the divorce process. Fortunately, the division of our assets seems to be quite simple since there is only a small mortgage left on the house. We can sell it and split the proceeds equally as soon as we pay off the mortgage. Despite the fact that Nancy had to make a difficult decision, she remained firm in her desire for an amicable settlement. Savings and checking accounts will be separated, and Jill's college fund will remain intact. She said there will be no alimony because you will live with a man who sits here and is an engineer now. Both of you, please leave the room. Nancy started crying when Mike grabbed her hand. When she reached the door, Nancy looked back at me and said, Nick, remember that the door is always open if you change your mind. Know that I really love you and want you in my life. Feeling a surge of anger, I went to the door and slammed it shut. After that, I went to the office and started making a complete list of things that required my attention. One of the top priorities was to find a lawyer, and without hesitation, I knew exactly who to turn to, Dustin Brown. Known for his tenacity and skill in divorce proceedings, he gained a formidable reputation as a tireless defender of wives. Unhappy husbands who became victims of his legal tactics often found themselves blinded, unaware of the impending storm. Over the years, our paths have crossed, and more than once I was ready to help him, even when it wasn't necessary. My motivation was an unshakable knowledge of the vile people he sought to bring to justice. They deserved retribution for every ounce. When I continued working on the list, the next important point was the analysis and evaluation of our common property. I uploaded the house data to an online platform. As a precaution, I transferred 50% of our funds to my personal accounts. I have taken the necessary steps to cancel our shared credit cards and issue a new one exclusively in my name. Looking through my checklist, I realized that there was only one important task left, to contact Jill and tell her the truth about the situation. Just the thought of telling our girl about her mother's act caused me deep mental pain. It took Jill a full five minutes to come to her senses before she could articulate her thoughts clearly. I was stunned by her unexpected response. Has she gone mad? Turned into a crazy creature? You've been incredibly kind to us all these years, and I refuse to have anything to do with her. I will not keep in touch with her. I will consider her dead to myself, Jill said calmly. I understand that you are very upset right now, and I sympathize with your emotions. Nancy is still your mother, and she loves you wholeheartedly. Please don't let this incident ruin your relationship with her. If you continue, it will be a loss for all of us. Could you at least wait a few days before discussing this with your mother? I asked. If she calls me, I will express my strong disapproval, the daughter replied. Please, if she calls, refrain from answering for a few days. Can you promise me that? Reluctantly, she agreed to comply with my request. Later that evening, Nancy expressed her concern to me, unsuccessfully trying to reach her daughter. I calmed Nancy down by telling her that I had already talked to Jill and she was visibly upset. I informed Nancy that our daughter needed to be alone to collect her thoughts before she was ready to resolve this issue with either of us. I suspect that you may have influenced her negative perception of me, Nancy accused me of poisoning our daughter's mind against her. I categorically denied such actions, explaining that I had simply informed her that her mother had been forced to abandon our relationship and seek new opportunities in Aldi. I conveyed this information calmly, knowing that it would most likely anger her. Before Nancy could answer, I decided to bring up one of the issues on the agenda. Nancy replied with a simple O. Oh. While I have the opportunity to talk to you, I strongly recommend that you consult with a lawyer. I'm asking you not to make this decision, she begged, and tears flowed down her face again. It really hurts me that you want to cut me out of your life. My love for you remains unshakable. Can't you find the strength to compromise for us? Have you even thought about it? She said abruptly, ending the conversation. Having decided to settle everything, I decided to take a week off to devote myself fully to this issue but the nights turned out to be unbearable, the overwhelming loneliness when I was lying in bed alone weighed on me every morning. I instinctively turned to Nancy at first. I decided to contact Dustin to remind him of her absence. 
I was caught off guard when Dustin informed me that Mike had already contacted him. This scheming scoundrel turned out to be cunning and obviously did a thorough research to find a better divorce lawyer than me. I expressed my annoyance. Well, if I can't use your services, could you at least recommend someone I should hire? Dustin snorted at the mention of Mike addressing him but clarified, I didn't say he hired me. I informed him that I'd already been hired for this job. Wow, I replied, feeling a surge of relief. I am very grateful that you took care of this for me, Nick. It's no secret that most men in this city perceive me as an antagonist, he said bitterly, but you've always treated me with respect. You helped me when it wasn't necessary, and I've always appreciated that in you. I want you to know I will never take her side. Thanks a lot again, although you'll still have to pay me a fee, he chuckled. I sincerely appreciate your understanding, but I also have financial obligations that need to be fulfilled. It's not a problem, Dustin. Thanks again. Despite the fact that it took several days to relieve the tension, the phone conversation between Nancy and Jill did not go smoothly. According to Jill, it escalated into a heated argument with hurtful insults. Nancy called me later, being on the verge of hysteria and believing that she had lost her daughter forever. But this is just the beginning, there is even more at stake. I assured her that I would talk to her and try to resolve the situation. After passing on my message, I ended the conversation. I had no idea that the task would be much more difficult than expected. Jill's anger didn't subside when I spoke to her again about a week later. My daughter informed me that she had made it clear to her mother that she no longer wanted to have anything to do with her. Nancy was not invited to her graduation, to her future wedding, or even to a meeting with potential grandchildren. It was at this moment that I finally understood the reason for Nancy's severe distress. You are my real daughter, I assured her without resorting to a DNA test. She laughed softly in response. Nancy's persistent calls continued until the very day of the official registration of the divorce. She constantly begged me to change my mind and agree to the proposed agreement, but my resolve remained unshakable. As soon as the divorce was finalized, I felt relieved, the calls abruptly stopped, and I was able to focus on further work. Fortunately, my hard work as the head of the detective department has given me a much-needed respite with a flexible schedule at my disposal. I immersed myself in my responsibilities, becoming more active and proactive over the next six months. I have taken responsibility for actively mentoring our newly minted detectives, making sure that they do not stray from the path and do not receive unproductive leads. In addition, I have devoted my time to a thorough study of our collection of cold cases, and my efforts were not in vain. We triumphantly solved a murder case that we had long forgotten about, surprisingly, it turned out that the real culprit was an ex-boyfriend, and the evidence was lying under our noses, remaining unnoticed until now. In recognition of this achievement, I was awarded a commendation and a well-deserved salary increase. After my divorce, Nancy wasted no time marrying Mike, which led to their interest in buying my part of the house. I couldn't bear the thought of Mike living in my old house, his threats to sue to get the sale didn't scare me at all. I stood my ground without flinching. Thanks to the help of local appraisers, I managed to significantly increase the value of the property, even though the price was too high, Mike made a deal. Although his audacity annoyed me at first, I eventually found a glimmer of hope, the sale brought in much more profit than I could have. Imagined. To my surprise, the divorce process turned out to be more favorable than I expected. I was looking through real estate listings on the internet when I came across a beautiful apartment that immediately caught my attention, its location was perfect, just a stone's throw from my workplace. Inspired by the prospect of owning my own home, I delved into the details, diving into the financial aspect. I realized that I should be grateful to Dustin, his meticulous questioning played a crucial role in discovering important information that could work in my favor. It turned out that the initial payment for our house was received from the inheritance of my beloved grandfather, this discovery meant that the funds were not considered common property. Armed with this knowledge, I found myself in an advantageous position. When the house was sold, I received about 75% of the proceeds, a significant amount that allowed me to make a fateful decision without hesitation. 
I decided to take a bold step to buy an apartment in this building. That evening, as I continued to look through the real estate listings, I couldn't help feeling excited and inspired by the idea that I would become the owner of a property conveniently located next to my workplace was a dream come true. It seemed the apartment perfectly matched my lifestyle and aspirations. It was about eight months after Mike in New York's wedding when I suddenly found myself having dinner at a restaurant alone. To my surprise, Nancy came over to my table and sat down. Despite her presence taking me by surprise, I made a conscious decision not to react to her with hostility. Looking around, I noticed Mike sitting at a table at the other end of the room, carefully studying the menu. How are you, Nick? Nancy asked softly. I'm fine, I replied, forcing myself to smile. And yours? I asked. I still feel like I miss you every day, she confessed, gently placing her hand on mine. My love for you is still deep. If you ever find the strength in your heart to accept Mike, I will do my best to be with you again. At first, I thought about taking my hand away and waving away her request. But then an idea struck me. This scheme required a preliminary conversation with Jill, but at the same time, it gave a chance to take revenge on this sneaky Mike. I must admit, Nancy, I miss you very much too. It's been a hard morning without you, but you're a married woman now. I guess your husband is looking for you. Nancy shot a quick glance at Mike, who looked puzzled. She confirmed my words with a nod and then rose gracefully from her chair. Remember that my love for you is unshakable, she whispered, and gracefully walked towards her husband. My God, I had no idea how amazingly ignorant this woman was. In the evening, I contacted Jill and outlined my plan to her. At first, she was shocked and expressed her disbelief. As I explained the reasons for my venture, her tone gradually changed, and soon there was laughter on her side. Wow, Dad, this is just perfect. Jill burst out laughing. You definitely have to agree. The next day, after receiving my daughter's enthusiastic approval, I called Nancy. I expressed a desire to talk to her and Mike, and she readily agreed, setting up a meeting at our old house at 7 o'clock in the evening. I arrived quickly at 7 o'clock, and Nancy showed me into the living room. It annoyed me that Mike was lying quietly on the couch in the very place that used to belong to me. Despite the obvious displeasure reflected in his frown, I found some comfort in the expression written on his face. It was clear that Nancy had set up this unexpected meeting for him, judging by the piercing daggers he pointed at me. I kept calm and pretended not to notice anything. When Nancy served us coffee and settled between me and her husband on the couch, I quickly got to the bottom of the matter. Wasting no time, I asked Nancy about the sincerity of her offer. Did she really mean it? A radiant smile instantly lit up Nancy's face as she replied, assuring me with complete confidence, of course, Nick. I'm still true to every word. My love for you is still deep, and my offer remains open. I have to admit that I have feelings for Mike too. If you are willing to consider this idea, I will carefully agree to such an agreement. Now, it seems to me that I have lost all of you, but with such a compromise, a part of you will be present in my life. Even at a certain time due to the lack of your presence, I feel incredibly isolated. Nancy's reaction was instant and violent. She rushed into my arms and kissed me with such force that it stirred up long-forgotten emotions. Nick, she exclaimed, gasping for breath. You just made me the happiest woman in the world. Now I can get the love of both men. Mike, clearly agitated, got up from his seat. He interjected, wait, we didn't talk about it. It's practically the same situation. Keeping calm, I turned to Mike and said, yes, but we've already discussed this. Mike, getting more and more heated, insisted, anyway, Nancy and I need to have a proper discussion. Nancy supported him, confirming, we've already discussed this. Mike's objections took me by surprise. We had discussed this issue in advance, and he expressed his willingness to share his wife if it would make her happy. It was unpleasant for me to see Mike struggling to pronounce words, and the disappointment was visible on his flushed face. Despite this setback, he continued to insist on the need for a more detailed discussion. 
Although I really wanted to point out Brian's hypocrisy, I decided to hold back and give Nancy and Mike the opportunity to talk on their own without my interference. I'll leave you both to deal with this, I said, stepping aside. Nancy, I'll be waiting for your choice. With that, I leaned over and gave her another passionate kiss, this time with a French twist, out of the corner of my eye. I noticed Furious Mike getting into the car, and I couldn't help but laugh. I successfully outplayed this arrogant guy. Mike felt awkward. Now, I imagine what kind of conversation would happen between them that night. The situation had completely changed, and it was very pleasant when the next day came. Anticipation filled the air. Nancy called me and told me that Mike was very upset at first, but Nancy decided to take a bold step and told him about his hypocritical behavior, threatening to leave if he did not agree. Surprisingly, he finally gave up. They came to an agreement and drew up a schedule, according to which Nancy spent one week with me and the other with Mike. Mike insisted that we could not continue this agreement until I had been tested for sexually transmitted diseases. I couldn't help but doubt the feasibility of their plan. Are they really that forgetful? I decided to take the test, but I made it clear that Nancy and Mike should also be tested. If Nancy didn't mind, then Mike was clearly unhappy. The results turned out to be clean for all of us. The next week, I went to their house, and Mike was waiting for me at the entrance. After parking, I entered the house and greeted Nancy with a kiss. I politely asked her to bring me some water. While she was fetching it, I couldn't resist provoking Mike by saying, Hey Mike, I'm going to spend the whole night with your wife, mimicking Ric Flair's tone. He was instantly furious, and it was obvious that he wanted to engage in a physical fight with me. I deliberately provoked him, anticipating his reaction. I made it clear to him that any aggressive actions towards me would lead to serious consequences, reminding him that attacking a police officer would not end well for him. Nancy handed me the bottle, which made Mike visibly angry. Despite the fact that he was seething with rage, he managed to repress it by hiding his emotions. Trying to prove his superiority, he passionately kissed Nancy right in front of my eyes, while I just kissed her on the cheek. Turning to Mike, I sarcastically thanked him for his cooperation and left, leaving him to decode my message. The next day, I watched three separate teams of detectives working at different crime scenes. As I headed to the second place, a distress signal sounded on the radio, alerting me to the riots taking place in the kitty cat bar. Once I was only one block away from home, I went out of curiosity to look for it. Upon arrival, I was greeted by disturbing news about riots involving a man under the influence of alcohol. To my surprise, the drunk turned out to be none other than Mike. Having decided to personally investigate the situation, I quickly dismissed the two officers, assuring them that I would deal with the matter myself. Turning my attention to Mike, I gently took his hand and said, Come on, Mike, let me take you home. In a fit of defiance, he resolutely refused my help, exclaiming, I don't need your help. Faced with his resistance, I confronted him with a choice, firmly stating, Mike, you have two options. I can either take you home or put you in jail. What do you prefer? He decided to accept the offer of a ride home. We didn't exchange a single word all the way to my former place of residence. When he got out of my car, his only comment was a snide insult. After dropping him off, I went up to him and advised him, don't waste any time. You only have six days left before I come and pick up your wife. By the fourth day, Mike's enthusiasm for the agreement had quickly waned. He and Nancy began to argue more often because of the current situation. He wanted it all to stop, but Nancy didn't understand his reasoning. Finally, when it was time to pick up Nancy for the planned week of living together, the situation seemed to have reached a boiling point. Mike and Nancy began to have a heated argument in the front yard. Determined to restore peace, I intervened to defuse the tension. I think you both should calm down before the situation gets out of control, I said calmly, keeping a slight grin on my face. Otherwise, someone may find it necessary to involve the authorities. Mike, filled with anger, stared at me and then turned his attention to Nancy. If you decide to go with him, then our relationship is over, he hissed. Nancy, who did not like to back down, 
sharply replied to him, Mike, we have agreed on a mutually beneficial agreement. I have not experienced anything like this during our previous meetings. Throughout our acquaintance with Mike, my ex-wife always spoke to him only with love and warmth. But this time, Mike felt disappointed and exclaimed, this agreement is worthless, raising his voice, making it clear that he was on the verge of breaking down. In response I warn Nancy once again, if you decide to be with him, it will be the end of our relationship. Nancy simply waved off his threat, dismissing it with a casual gesture. She answered confidently, that's not what you mean. She reminded him that he was the one who originally suggested the idea of sharing, which she found funny and liked very much. Nancy's worried expression, although it seemed forced, heightened the tension of the moment. I watched as Mike stormed into the house in a rage and slammed the door. I turned to Nancy for clarification, who only shrugged her shoulders in response. He's acting like a child, she remarked, twining her hand with mine. He'll calm down soon and everything will go back to normal. Maybe you should talk to him and try to make the relationship work. I'll pick you up later in the evening, I informed her before heading to the office. Unfortunately, normal life did not resume as expected. In fact, everything was far from normal, which took me by surprise later that day. A call came in from a detective which further complicated the situation. Sir, I regret to inform you that a tragic incident has occurred. There was a crime, the detective said. When I inquired about the victim's identity, I was horrified to learn that it was Nancy. According to Mike, he was the perpetrator. It was an impulsive act caused by anger. We have detained Mike and are now taking him for questioning, the detective informed me. This news overwhelmed me with guilt over Nancy's untimely death. I am deeply concerned about how to break this terrifying news to Jill, as I fear she may hold a grudge against me for my involvement in this situation. Despite my desire to be present during Mike's interrogation, the team, knowing about my personal history with him, advised me to keep my distance. Reluctantly, I agreed and returned to my office. I dialed Jill's number and told her what had happened. As expected, she didn't put the blame on me but kept silent. She just asked for some time and said she would call when she felt better. I didn't say anything else after that. Mike was escorted to prison for the necessary legal procedures, and paperwork began after the autopsy. I took responsibility for issuing documents for Nancy's body and began preparations for the funeral. The next day, Jill joined me, and we hugged tightly. Both burst into tears. I'm so sorry, Jill, I whispered through my sobs. It's all because of me. In response, she reassured me, you're not guilty, Dad. She assured me that it wasn't my fault. When I was sitting in my office, there was a knock on the door, and a woman came in introducing herself as Arya from the FBI. She quickly showed her ID and explained that they needed the weapons used in the Nancy case. I was stunned by the directness and speed of her request. She handed me some documents and informed me that the suspect, Mike was under investigation for committing a crime against his previous wife, who was believed to have died in an accident. This discovery came as a surprise to me since Mike had not been considered a suspect before. Her father managed to pull off several moves and get us involved in this case, even though he was in Japan. But I couldn't help but wonder how he could be in Japan and the USA on the same day given the time difference. The police cleverly used this in their report, he landed in Japan boarded a plane 30 minutes later, and arrived in the United States. An amazing feat, isn't it? And remember, you haven't heard any of this from me, she said. I nodded in understanding and continued my inquiries. For what purpose do you need these weapons? According to our suspicions, this is the same weapon that was used in the previous incident with his ex-wife. We completed all the necessary procedures and handed it over to her. We will provide you with a report that you can use in court in this case, she said. After giving this information, she got up from her seat and left. Three months have passed. Mike has been found guilty in both cases and is currently serving a 30-year sentence in prison. For the next week, Jill stayed with me while we mourned her mother. More than six months have passed, and when I returned to the empty house I fell into silence. My heart is filled with bittersweet memories of happier times, 
but they only increased the pain inside me. If only Nancy hadn't made such a stupid choice. I wish things had been different. Waking up on a peaceful Sunday morning, I turned my gaze to my beloved wife, Rosa, with whom we had been married for five happy years. When she woke up, she gently pulled me to her and bit into my lips with a gentle kiss. Rosa expressed her fatigue from the previous night and asked to refrain from intimate relations this morning. I understood her fatigue, but the desire to conceive a child made me persevere, hugging me tightly. Rose assured me that patience would eventually lead to the realization of our dream of parenthood. We spent some time in bed having a conversation that inevitably turned to her professional aspirations. Rose's thoughts were consumed by her burning desire to be promoted to the respected position of regional sales manager. After enduring a few minutes of this familiar conversation, I invited her to take a shower, and I went to get her favorite specialty coffee. Rose approved of the idea, and as I was heading for the door, I suddenly remembered that my car keys were missing. Remembering that Rose carries spare keys in her purse just in case, I noticed that her purse was lying on the kitchen table. Instead of going back upstairs, I decided to get the keys out of her purse. Looking into the depths of her bag, I was amazed at how difficult it is to find something in the chaos but my search led me to a hidden zipper inside the compartments of the handbag. Curious, I unzipped the zipper and found a stash of birth control pills. This finding seemed strange to me as Rose assured me that she had stopped taking them a couple of months ago as we were actively trying to conceive a child. After examining the packaging, I noticed that a significant part of the pills had been consumed. Turning her over, I saw a prescription label indicating that she had recently purchased just a new supply of contraceptives. Carefully putting everything back in its place, I silently, without arousing Rose's suspicions, took out the car keys and went upstairs. Countless thoughts raced through my head as I went to get coffee. I couldn't understand why she lied to me that she had stopped taking birth control, although I was sure she wasn't having an affair since she spent most of her time either at work or with me. Her close friend was married to my best friend, which left no room for mystery. The only unaccounted for time was during her working hours, which puzzled me. I was deeply disappointed because it seemed that she did not want to have children, although apparently she tried. Around four o'clock in the afternoon, Rose shook me to get my attention and asked what was wrong with me because I had been distracted all day. Confused, I asked where we were going. She reminded me that we were planning to have dinner at Bill and Sherry's house. After dinner, Bill asked me to help him in the store. Once there, he noticed that something was bothering me and asked me to share it. Reluctantly, I admitted that I had discovered that Rose had stopped taking birth control a couple of months ago. We discussed the possible reasons, and Bill suggested hiring a private investigator to find out the truth. Despite my belief that Rose was not having an affair, Bill demanded that I prove it. Following Bill's advice, I hired a private investigator from our company for security purposes. He assured me that based on the information he had received, it did not look like Rose was having an affair with another man. He promised to monitor her actions both at work and outside. He also advised checking her medical record, as there may be other factors. Although the private investigator regularly reported the latest news, I did not receive any significant news. Despite my attempts to hide my emotions, my intimacy with Rose suffered. Rose eventually came out to me on Saturday and demanded to know why I was avoiding her. I defensively accused her of not wanting sex, which caused a heated argument, our first serious quarrel. When I confided in Bill, he warned me that if I didn't change my behavior quickly, Rose would suspect that I was up to something. Taking Bill's advice to heart, I humbly apologized to Rose, explaining my behavior as fear. She looked confused and worried at the same time, which made me wonder if she was having an affair. For the first time, Bill, who was trying to keep his mind, helped me focus and keep a positive attitude. By the middle of the third week, I started thinking about Rose's upcoming 25th birthday and wanted to plan something special. Bill's wife, Sherry, came up with the idea of throwing a birthday party for me. She suggested cutting the cake in half and doing other similar things. On Thursday morning, I met with a private investigator, hoping for a short meeting, which eventually lasted more than two hours. 
After the detective left, I sat alone in a daze until the phone rang. It was Bill, who knew that I had just met with a private investigator. I told him that we needed to meet and that I needed a stronger drink. By the time Bill showed up at the bar, I was already finishing my third cocktail. Bill looked at me and immediately realized that something was wrong. The initial shock of what I discovered passed, replaced by a growing anger that consumed me. I handed the evidence folder to Bill, and he began to study the photos with dates and times. He asked about the CD in the folder, and I explained that it contained a video recording of Rose, my wife, having an intimate relationship with her boss. A private investigator advised me to watch the video and pay attention to the dialogue, suggesting that I would be surprised by Rose's motives. Bill called his wife and asked her to take Rose to the cinema or the mall, as we were planning to celebrate her birthday. Sherry, of course, was thrilled, thinking she was helping Rose with something good. Bill and I watched the CD, which brought tears to my eyes, and the private investigator was right. I was completely surprised by the reason Rose was with her boss. Rose slept with her boss for one reason, to get the promotion she's been talking about all these months. We sat in silence and just drank, saying only, do you want another drink? And of course, I answered yes. After a long silence, I said to Bill, you know, if Rose came to me and said she was in love with her boss, or if she said she wasn't satisfied with the sex life she was getting from me and she needed something more, I know I can handle it. Of course, it would hurt me, as it does now. In fact, I would be full of resentment and disappointment. I would feel that even though I gave my all to the marriage, I would feel like I let Rose. Now I'm sitting here watching my wife sleep with her boss just to get a damn promotion. I'm not just offended, I'm also mad as hell, and by God, Rose will feel how angry I am. Bill said, watching her sleep with the boss, you realize that she seems to be around, but she's not, you know what I mean? Well, it doesn't matter now because she put her job ahead of her marriage, and now she's going to have to live with her decision. When Bill handed me my drink, he said, the girls would be coming home soon. Do you know what you're going to do? Yes, yes, I think so, I said. I looked up at Bill. Next Monday is Rose's birthday, and I want to throw her a surprise party that she will never forget. Time is running out, so I need your help, and I'd like to involve Sherry in this if you don't mind. Bill agreed but reminded me that Sherry and Rose are close friends and Sherry won't do anything to hurt Rose. I assured him that I didn't need Sherry for that. I just needed her help in inviting the right people to the party. In addition, I asked Bill to attend the party to help me carry out my plan. I pretended to be more drunk than I actually was when the girls returned home the next day at work. I found a person with computer skills in the delivery department who could fulfill my special request. I explained to him that I needed photos and videos, and he assured me that it would not be difficult. Then I contacted Sherry and informed her of my plan, stressing that I wanted the party to remain a surprise. We agreed to have a party on Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I asked Sherry to help me get in touch with all the necessary people. I also asked her to find a way to keep Rose out of the house for a few hours on Sunday. Before I ended the conversation, I said that I would inform Rose's parents about the surprise party later. I went into Rose's office and invited her boss to a party, explaining that it would be a surprise for her birthday. I even suggested that he take his wife with him to make it more pleasant for her. To ensure the party went unnoticed, I advised him to park at the nearest school so that when Rose's friend brought her home, she would not notice the presence of a large number of cars. My brother will be responsible for escorting the guests from the party venue to my house. It promises to be an amazing event, and I hope that he will be able to attend after work. I visited Rose's parents and shared my idea of a birthday celebration. Rose's mom has collected various photos of Rose starting with her birth and ending with our wedding. Later that evening, I met with a computer expert at his house. I handed him all the collected materials and told him about my vision of the evening. He didn't say anything special, but after listening carefully to me, he suggested an alternative approach that would have a greater effect on everyone. I was intrigued by his offer, and agreeing, he assured me that everything would be ready by Saturday. On Wednesday, 
I visited the lawyer's office to begin the divorce process, citing adultery as the reason. The lawyer also advised me to sue Rose's boss and the company they both worked for. He expressed confidence that we would be able to receive financial compensation from Rose's company. On Friday evening, I sat across from Bill, feeling overwhelmed by the situation. When you think it can't get any worse, you always find a way out, I confessed to him. Bill asked curiously what I meant. On Wednesday, I had a longer than expected meeting with a lawyer. When I left the office, my thoughts were preoccupied with marital problems, as a result of which I forgot to return to work and apply for a tender. As a result, the company did not receive the order, and I was suspended from work for 30 days without pay. Fortunately, my boss, who knows about my family problems, intervened and prevented my dismissal. He wants me to distance myself from Rose and the mess we're in so I can focus and come to my senses. He offered me his timeshare in Mexico, insisting that if I wanted to keep my job, I had to be there no later than Wednesday. Bill asked if I planned to go, and I replied with a categorical yes. I can't afford to lose this job. And now let's discuss the details and possibilities for a surprise party in honor of Rose's birthday, I explained. I shared how the photos would be displayed and my vision of the evening. I also asked Bill to make sure that Rose's boss didn't miss the whole show. I informed Bill that the man playing the bartender would also hand Rose and her boss divorce papers. When I got home, Rose was furious and demanded to know where I had been. I mentioned casually that I was with Bill, downplaying the significance of the situation. But Rose insisted that it was very important because she had great news and I wasn't there to hear it. She accused me of drinking too much and avoiding her, and even suggested that I had a girlfriend. Her accusations infuriated me, and I felt my face turn red with anger. I could see that she was now worried about my reaction, but I remembered Bill's advice and managed to pull myself together. I swallowed my pride, apologized, and assured her that I didn't have a girlfriend. I begged her to tell me the good news she mentioned. To my surprise, Rose excitedly announced that she had been promoted and would be the new regional sales manager starting next month. She jumped for joy and then rushed to me and hugged me tightly. At that moment, I realized that she was capable of surprising me even more than I thought. Still holding her close, I asked her what she meant when she said she wanted to have a baby. Rose quickly returned to my arms and explained that we were lucky, and she was sure that everything was finally going our way. She regarded her promotion as a sign of positive changes in our lives. I love you very much, and I know that you will make me a mother, she looked at me, her eyes full of hope, and asked, you want to start a family, don't you, darling? Rose thought that my tears were tears of joy at the prospect of having a child, but she did not know that they were tears of sadness at the realization that I would soon lose the only woman I had ever loved. Taking my hand, Rose led me into her bedroom, and we made passionate love. The next morning, she wanted more intimacy, but I was just doing my job. As I stood in the shower, lost in my thoughts, Rose came in and joined me. Rose's worried expression made her ask if something was bothering me. She admitted that for several weeks, I had not behaved as usual and had been drinking a lot. I quickly came up with a story blaming myself for the fact that we couldn't conceive a child. I assumed that there might be something wrong with my body and that I should see a doctor. After all, she hadn't taken birth control for months, right? Without answering my question, Rose hugged me tightly and assured me that I was taking too much on myself. She thought that now that she had been promoted at work, she would feel better, and somehow she knew that I would impregnate her soon. I couldn't help but think that she could explain it if she really wanted to. That Saturday night, Rose wanted intimacy again, and this time I reciprocated her feelings. She felt that there was a lack of genuine emotion in my lovemaking, it was just physical intimacy. Sunday morning came, and I was surprisingly calm. While Rose was taking a shower, I called Sherry and asked if she had a plan to pick Rose up from home. Sherry assured me that there was an expressed pride that I had organized a surprise party for Rose, knowing that it would be an unforgettable event. I almost burst out laughing at the thought, realizing how unforgettable it would be. As Rose was coming down the stairs, I asked her about her plans for the day. Confused, she asked, 
Why did Bill call and ask you to help him today? Because Sherry assigned him to work on a to-do list, I explained. Rose responded enthusiastically, agreeing to join Sherry and Bill for breakfast and then help Sherry choose curtains for their bedroom. At 3.10 p.m., Sherry followed Rose into our house, and everyone screamed, surprise. Rose was genuinely stunned and hugged me, expressing her gratitude for the unexpected holiday. As I looked around the room and watched all the guests, I heard Rose ask Sherry if she had invited her boss. When Sherry replied in the negative, I noticed that Rose's worried expression had returned. When my two key people took their seats, the party began with laughter and communication. I waited for almost two hours, making sure that everyone had food, but most importantly, an adequate supply of alcohol. With Bill's help, we gathered everyone and led them into the living room, preparing for the event of the year. Thank you all for coming, I said to the audience. But before we let Rose open her cards and gifts, let's take a look at the first half of her 25th birthday celebration. Looking around, I couldn't help but smile at the presence of Rose's parents, her cousin, and even her boss, who brought his wife. Finally, everyone took their seats, looking forward to the start of the show. Since everyone knew about the theme of the party, there was anticipation in the room. I turned on the TV and plugged in the laptop, announcing, let's get started. The first image on the screen was of a naked two-month-old Rose lying on a bed. The crowd booed and roared when I jokingly commented on how delightful she looked. Rose blushed deeply as picture after picture slowly appeared on the screen. Each time, I made a joking or explanatory comment, often asking her mother for help, which led to many laughs. In a good mood, the photo showed her path from elementary to high school. When her graduation photo appeared, I took the opportunity to praise Rose for her dedication. If Rose is striving for something, she will stop at nothing to achieve it, I said. Then we moved on to college photos, and I jokingly told her that, thanks to her dedication, Rose ended up with me as a student. Laughter filled the room, and Rose enjoyed the entertainment. Then, our wedding photo appeared prompting joking comments about my long hair at the time. After that, an image of the building where Rose works appeared on the screen, and I informed everyone, Rose works here. The following image showed her desktop. I explained that she got this desk thanks to a promotion after becoming a top salesperson. As I said before, when Rose sets a goal for herself, she always achieves it regardless of obstacles, I added. In the next photo, Rose's boss and his wife were sitting at our table during a party in honor of former Mo employees. Rose was sitting next to her boss, and next to her was another employee, but I wasn't in the picture. Rose's smile disappeared, replaced by a familiar worried expression. I glanced at her boss, who also seemed to have lost his smile. Moreover, I noticed that they exchanged glances. I told everyone, I sincerely hope that Rose's boss will recognize and appreciate her continued dedication, hard work, and support her desire to be promoted to the position of regional sales manager, which she so longs for. As I was finishing my statement, my eyes were fixed on Rose. To my surprise, I noticed an expression of fear on her face. Since she had previously admitted to me that she wanted this position, my comment now caused her fear as she wondered if I had somehow revealed her secret. With a sense of urgency, I pressed the button to start the video recording, addressing everyone present. It is impossible to adequately convey the tremendous efforts that Rose has put into achieving this new role. Let's move on to the photos, shall we? The video began showing an unoccupied bed, and my wife's voice talking to the boss, saying that this meeting would be the last according to their agreement. As soon as Rose fell silent, the video quickly switched to her lying on the bed while her boss engaged in intimate intimacy with her. A collective sigh swept through the hall, causing several people to hurriedly leave. The video shifted dramatically again, capturing Rose on all fours while her boss stood behind her, continuing his movements. When the scene changed, Rose's boss exclaimed, Damn, girl, with such dedication, you will rise to the status of vice president. The video lasted about 15 seconds, and there were still 15 seconds left to demonstrate two more positions, but then chaos began. Rose jumped up, screaming for me to stop the video, tears streaming down her face as she apologized. 
Her boss tried to leave quickly, but he was intercepted by my friend Bill, who firmly ordered him to stay put. When the boss tried to get around Bill, he received a powerful blow to the jaw from Bill's fist, which forced him to return to his seat. Another member of my team shouted out the boss's name, and upon receiving an answer, said, you have received a summons, and threw legal documents into his lap. At this time, Sherry, busy comforting Rose, did not notice how the boss's wife came up from the side. The boss's wife grabbed Sherry by the hair and forcefully pushed her away, causing her to stumble and fall onto the couch next to her. At the same time, Sherry yanked Rose's arm, forcing her to turn to face the boss's wife, who was hurling insults at my wife. I saw her deliver a powerful blow right to Rose's cheekbone. Rose was thrown back, eventually, she fell on her back and slowly rolled onto her side. In response, Sherry jumped to her feet and ran screaming to the boss's wife, trying to intervene. Bill was quickly approaching the women when Sherry was pushed violently again, but this time Bill managed to catch her before she fell to the floor. I hurried to intervene, but since Rose was already on the floor and Bill was holding Sherry, I decided that the worst was over. The boss's wife turned around and started verbally attacking Rose. Rose, who was on her knees, reached for the ottoman and put her hand on it, slowly raising her knee. She tried to stand up, putting her foot on the carpet. When Rose stood up, her back was facing the boss's wife, and her feet were about a foot apart. I went over to Rose to help her and make sure she wasn't hit again. When I turned my head to see where the boss's wife was, I saw that she had taken a full step towards my wife. Then, as an NFL player, she kicked Rose right in the middle between her legs. I was just putting my hand on Rose's arm when I felt a blow that made Rose's whole body shudder. If the boss's wife had been hitting a soccer ball, it would have easily gone 40 yards. Rose's body flew two or three feet forward. She let out a scream louder than I've ever heard. Rose landed on the ottoman, bounced off it, and fell on her side. She continued to scream from the moment she was kicked until she finally landed on the carpet. Once on the carpet, Rose curled up, hugging her knees to her chest and clasping her hands between her legs, and sobbed as hard as I had ever heard. Bill grabbed the boss's wife by the neck and forcibly dragged her out of the house, telling her and her pathetic husband to leave. While Bill was escorting the boss's wife out, she was screaming, I bet you won't get promoted now. Sherry rushed to Rose's aid, screaming for me to move away. Ignoring Sherry's pleas, I went up to Rose and told her that I never meant her any harm. Rose was in so much pain that I realized she couldn't hear me. Looking down, I noticed blood seeping into her cotton trousers. I grabbed Sherry to get her attention and pointed at the blood. Sherry immediately told me to call 911. I didn't go with Rose in the ambulance but took my car. I didn't expect such a physical attack, and I didn't want Rose to get hurt. At that moment, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Bill, Sherry, and I were sitting in the waiting room when the ER doctor came over to discuss Rose's condition. He informed me that Rose would be operated on as soon as a specialist arrived. He asked me what happened, and I explained that she had been kicked in the crotch by another woman. After a few more questions, he asked if I wanted to see her, to which I replied with a firm no. After a few hours, the attending physician finally came out to talk to me. He expressed his amazement, saying that he had never seen such injuries before. The impact was strong, causing the tissues to rupture in three different directions due to the force of the impact. If everything does not heal properly, it can negatively affect her sexual sensations. Curious. I asked about the specific consequences. The doctor explained that the damaged area plays an important role in stimulating a woman during sexual intercourse, contributing to her pleasure and ability to achieve pleasure. At 8.30 p.m., the doctor started to leave but stopped and looked back at me. He mentioned that Rose had expressed concern about her future fertility. After assuring me, he said that she is still capable of having as many children as we want but we will have to postpone our plans for several months until she fully recovers and is able to engage in intimacy again. He informed me that she would be in rehab for a few hours before we could visit her. A few minutes later, Bill and I left the hospital, and Sherry stayed. At 8.59 p.m., 
we stopped for a snack and talked for a while, after which I went home. The following Monday, around 10 a.m., Sherry called me. Where are you coming to visit Rose? she asked. Not knowing, I answered, probably tomorrow. Sherry immediately began to scold me, and I abruptly interrupted the conversation and turned off the phone. On Tuesday, just after lunch, I went into Rose's room. Sherry gave me a disapproving look as I walked over to Rose's bed. Before Rose could say anything, I spoke up. Rose, I want you to know, I really wanted to insult you, shame you, and make it clear to everyone that it was your actions, not mine, that destroyed our marriage. You lied to me about taking birth control, and you were unfaithful. But I want to clarify that I never intended or wanted to physically harm you. Despite the enormous anger, I've never felt. Before, I've never had the thought of physically hurting you. I hope you can believe me. Tears streamed down her face, and I turned to leave, but Rose reached out and grabbed my shoulder, begging me to stay. She believed that I would never hurt her like that. Reluctantly, I answered, no, I just can't, Rose. I'm leaving town for a month today. You see, because of your infidelity, my mind and heart were in turmoil and I made a serious mistake at work. The bosses wanted to fire me, but my understanding boss, who knows about our marital problems, intervened and prevented it. Now I'm facing disciplinary action and my boss has supported me again. I was suspended from work for 30 days without pay. I was informed that I have a 30-day deadline to solve our problems and put my thoughts in order. My boss generously offered me his real estate in Mexico and allowed me to cash out the unused three weeks of vacation. In response to Sherry's request not to leave, I assured her that I could not and did not want to put my job at risk. I also thanked Rose, who taught me to give preference to a career over marriage. Rose immediately apologized and expressed remorse. Turning to Rose, I added that there was one more issue to resolve, I'm not done with her boss yet, and I intend to make him pay for his actions. I assured her that any consequences she would face were not in my plans because, in my opinion, she had already suffered enough. But I warned her to be ready, as her boss might sacrifice her to protect himself. The party was cleaned up, and all the materials provided by the private investigator, as well as the divorce papers, were on the kitchen table. When I mentioned the divorce papers, Rose squeezed my hand tightly, hoping not to let me pull away, and the tears started flowing again. I left these materials with her, not to cause more pain, but in case she could use them to protect herself from her boss. I urged her to find a good lawyer and take the necessary precautions. I informed her of my impending departure for the plane. Rose insisted adamantly that she wouldn't sign the divorce papers until we had a thorough discussion. I shook my head, making it clear that she no longer had control over the situation and I wasn't obliged to comply. As I got ready to leave, Rose begged me to stay and suggested a meeting upon my return. Pausing, I looked into her eyes, seeing tears forming. She professed her love and pleaded for a meeting after I came back. However, at that moment, I refused, stating the pain of being around her. While my feelings might change upon my return, uncertainty remained. The journey passed quietly, with Bill aware of most of the unfolding events and my strategy concerning Rose's employer. I asked for updates on her boss's situation. With a smirk, Bill commented on my enduring affection for Rose and promised to keep me updated on her too. I laughed, acknowledging my love for her but reaffirming my determination not to be influenced.